The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander. And as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, a senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we're going to pick up our conversation that we started last week talking about U.S.-China-Africa relations. This is the second of two shows that we're going to do on this topic, in part because the shifts that are going on in the geopolitical framework are so profound and they're moving so fast in some senses uh, that we really want to dive deep into. That's why we're doing two shows back to back. Last week, we spoke with uh, Rand Corporation's Ali Wynn, and we got really the look at the U.S.-China relationship. And then you and I kind of connected the dots at the end to how that might impact Africa. Today, we're going to actually dive right into the U.S.-China-Africa relationship, particularly through the vantage point of John Bolton and who is the U.S. National Security Advisor for the United States. He represents this much more hawkish Trump worldview and Trump foreign policy, uh, not just with Africa, not just with China, not just with Iran, Syria, Saudi Arabia, all of them. Uh, he's drawing lines all over the place. And But we're going to look at it from the U.S.-China-Africa relationship through the eyes of John Bolton to start with, but then, of course, expanding into the broader strategic security relationship that the United States has around the world. So if you recall, last December, December 13th, John Bolton went to the Heritage Foundation, which is a think tank in Washington, and he gave a highly anticipated speech about the new U.S. strategy for Africa entitled Prosper Africa. There was a lot of anticipation for it, and it took a lot of people by surprise, in part because it was much heavier on challenging Russia and Chinese influence in Africa than a lot of people expected. Let's kind of review just very quickly, because I know it's been a while, it's been a couple months now since that speech. In the strategy, there were really three main tenets, advancing U.S. trade and commercial ties across the region. He said specifically that he's seeking reciprocity, never, quote, subservience. And that was a dig, I think, towards the Chinese. Uh, they want to fight Islamic terrorists like al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, and their affiliates. And then the third point was the use of U.S. tax dollars for aid to make them to use them more efficiently and effectively. And this is a quote from him. No longer support unproductive, unsuccessful, unaccountable U.N. peacekeeping missions. That was very interesting. And Kobus, it's so interesting to contrast the tone of what Bolton said in that speech compared to what the Chinese do, which is they're really all about multilateral peacekeeping and the United Nations, and their support is generally effusive. Bolton's speech, for the most part, was big news in the United States, very big news here in China. But yet in Africa, it wasn't quite as well-received as many people expected. It was relatively mutedly re uh, received in on social media and in the popular press in Africa. And, you know, I mean, obviously, sometimes the popular press in Africa tends to be preoccupied with African issues. But uh, in cases like, for example, the S-hole country's insult that, that President Trump um, leveled at Africa a while ago, that was very widely covered in the popular press in Africa. So, so they do pick up sometimes. In the elite press, so when we're talking about you know, kind of like think tankers and columnists and economists writing for newspapers. It was it was discussed, but it wasn't particularly warmly discussed. Um, it was seen as, you know, a lot of people pointed out that um, for all of this um, pose of, of empowering Africa in relation to global powers, um, Africa wasn't consulted in, you know, kind of in, in the making of the plan. And Africa has a lot of a lot of kind of development plans that it's set up over the last few years. So, so that was an issue. Um, and then also it was seen as, 
a little condescending, you know, in the, in the first place, because it seemed to assume that, that African leaders are very, very easily duped by China, um, and that it also got some facts wrong, you know. So, so the, the facts that they, that they quoted, or the, the, the figures that they quoted about how indebted the Zambian government is to China, particularly that certain assets are going to be taken over, the Zambian government has been denying that for a while. So, it, the, you know, the, the, the complexity and the, the shadedness of that issue wasn't accounted for in the document. So the emphasis on China took a lot of people by surprise. Bolton mentioned the word China 14 different times. And so a lot of people walked away thinking this was less about a policy for Africa and more part of the American global effort to contain, challenge China uh, all over the world. So to get a sense of the tone, let's take a listen to the first mention that John Bolton uh, had about China. And it gives you a sense of, the, of how the thinking is in relation to the White House and what they think of China in terms of, well, they don't think much of them. China uses bribes, opaque agreements, and the strategic use of debt to hold states in Africa captive to Beijing's wishes and demands. Its investment ventures are riddled with corruption and do not meet the same environmental or ethical standards as U.S. developmental programs. Such predatory actions are subcomponents of broader Chinese strategic initiatives, including One Belt, One Road, a plan to develop a series of trade routes leading to and from China, with the ultimate goal of advancing Chinese global dominance. So let's get into it right now to find out more about this policy. It has been almost two and a half months now since, or about two months now since Bolton's speech. We have not seen any follow up. And an interesting column ran this past weekend in the South China Morning Post by our old friends of the show, uh, Professors Joshua Eisenman and David Shin. David Shin from George Washington University and Joshua Eisenman from the University of Texas. Both have been on the show before. China has nothing to fear from America's Africa strategy as it's largely bluster. Strong words coming from, uh, from both professors. And we are thrilled to have Josh uh, back on the show with us, a very good morning to you from Austin, Texas. Go Longhorns. Yeah, good morning, guys. Great to be back on. It's fantastic to have you, especially because the, the timing of your column and the timing of our discussion perfectly aligned. So you said right out of the gate, uh, China has nothing to fear. It's just, it's just, you know, bold proclamations of U.S. intent. But at the end of the day, it's not carrying a whole lot of weight because you don't believe that the Trump administration is going to actually put any muscle behind it. Give us your take on what you and Ambassador Shin kind of laid out in the South China Morning Post column. OK, happy to do it, Eric. Um, first, I should say that uh, we don't title our own articles any more than anyone else does. So um, Ambassador Shin and I did not title this article, nor did we select the cartoon uh, that accompanied it. We simply wrote the article. So um, I, I can't take credit for the title. Um, I can only speak to the ideas uh, behind the article, uh, which Ambassador Shin and I crafted together. Um, I suppose the, the kind of upshot is that there is... In D.C. right now, what seems to be somewhat of an echo chamber going on, um, where people are talking about debt trap diplomacy, people are talking about China losing in Africa, China being pushed out of Africa, China not being successful in Africa. Um, but I don't, you know, to me, I think that is a, a kind of drinking our own Kool-Aid and passing it around to each other. Um, if China's failing in Africa, it's the worst failure I've ever seen, uh, because those uh, the numbers over the last 20 years speak for themselves. Now, you guys have done some great work showing how we may be at what you call peak China-Africa economic relations. That may well be the case, but there's no doubt that over the last 20 years, China has uh, made a lot of uh, uh, headway in Africa, um, especially on the economic and political front and, and even on the, on the military front. So um, it seems to me that there is this narrative going on in Washington which says we can just wait the Chinese out, that the Chinese are, are failing in Africa and, and given an Enough time, they'll just fail. So the, the best policy from the U.S. should be do nothing. And the follow-up policy, uh, what we're hearing from Bolton is, no, 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 we should do more. We should do everything. We should get in this thing. We should compete with China. We should go head-to-head -head against China and Africa for whatever that means. But the point that Ambassador Shin and I are trying to make in our article is simply that it takes more than saying that 
to do that. And that requires the resources. It requires the rhetoric. It requires um, a structural situation conducive to that. Um, we all know, and you have gone over in great, great detail on the show, um, how China's um, loans for infrastructure work. Um, and the U.S. simply does not do that. We are not set up for that. So the idea that we can compete against that kind of a model is fanciful. It was fanciful when John Kerry said it during his Senate confirmation hearing years ago, and it's uh, fanciful now. And we'll be just as disappointed uh, this time as we were uh, when John Kerry said we have to get in the game and compete with China and Africa. We are simply not in that game. We are on in a different game. We're in a game of globalization. R raw materials, as it's been going on for a decade now, go to China. They're manufactured. They're into products. And those products are sold to Chinese, Africans, Americans, and people all around the world. So this is part of a global supply chain. It's not that we can go in there and buy more minerals and make widgets better than China does. So the whole idea that we're going to compete with China economically on the continent, um, to Ambassador Shin and I, it doesn't hold with the numbers. Josh, is it is it fair to say that that there's been no action in in the you know the new policy direction in the U.S. in relation to Africa since the since the Bolton announcement? You know, if from the African side it looked very quiet, like the announcement was was made, and then there was you know people were like, oh okay, you know, kind of new engagement. We'll see what happens. And so far there hasn't been a lot. Like what what is what is happening in Washington around this issue, or is it actually has it really just been an announcement and then? Cricket. Well, Africa is always the lowest priority in Washington, always. So um, the fact that it would go to crickets or, well, back to normal isn't surprising. Um, now, as, as uh, Eric mentioned, I'm not in Washington. I'm in Austin. But from all that I can hear, and I also mentioned I'm not an Africanist. I, I study China. So there, there may be discussions ongoing that I'm unaware of. But I certainly, like you, Cobus, haven't heard anything else. Um, now, I'd like to make a comment, if I might, about why the U.S.-China relationship has kind of seeped into other relationships, in this case, the Africa relationship. Um, and I think that it has to do with the great disappointment that Eric talked about last week on the show in Washington that Americans feel about the U.S.-China relationship. And if I could go back a decade to when I worked uh, on Capitol Hill, there were three general perceptions of the future of China politically. The first was, and the mainstream view, was that it would continue to liberalize, that over time uh, China would become a more increasingly liberal, politically, uh, liberal political country, um, and that uh, following the economic liberalization, we would see political liberalization. Clearly, that has not been the case. The second view was that China would simply muddle through, as it had been doing, that like a rickety house in the wind, it would neither uh, fall over, uh, nor would it be firm, but it would continue. Um, and the third was, um, and this was a distinctly minority view, but held by some very prominent folks, that the Communist Party of China was not long for this world, that it simply could not survive. But 10 years ago in Washington, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who predicted a return to the hard authoritarianism of Xi Jinping that we have today. So people were very disappointed because even the most pessimistic view was not to some degree pessimistic enough to account for where we are politically now. Moreover, there is great disappointment in the American China watching community who is who is perceived of as for decades painting over uh, China's faults with overly rosy predictions and that they should have known better. Some of us did. Many of us did not. Many of the most senior people did not. And so there is not only a great disappointment in Beijing, but there is moreover a much greater disappointment perhaps in the China watching community and their inability to predict where we are today. They've lost credibility in Washington and that has therefore ceded ground to the hawks, the people who had been saying, you see, all along this overly rosy prediction had been wrong. Um, you should not have been listening to them. Um, and I think it's important to place into context this Africa strategy that you mentioned that has these 14 mentions of China um, and mentions Russia only kind of on the side. Uh, so the China isn't the only other one mentioned, but it has a lot to do with the feeling towards China in Washington and the fact that this great disappointment reigns in both parties and in almost all quarters of the government. Yeah, I think that is so important. And it's interesting because and when you and I were talking over lunch while you were in Shanghai uh, last month, uh, you were much more passionate and less measured as you are now. <laughs> and I think that what's interesting is the fact that that energy that you have about – 
the feelings that Americans have of being feeling betrayed by the Chinese, lied to consistently by the Chinese. The fact, and and I had a, a discussion with some Fudan University students uh, just last week, in fact, and I was conveying some of the energy that you kind of spoke to me about, about how Americans, particularly those in Washington, feel. And it's this sense uh, that we have lost face. And that's language that the Chinese understand, that you have disrespected us. You continue to steal our intellectual property. You force our companies into joint ventures. Nothing irritates me more now than to see Chinese auto companies going into the United States and opening up dealers. They don't have to hand over 50 cents of every dollar to a joint venture partner. They don't have to give over their IP. They don't have to be bound by an American government corporation that limits their ability to move. You know, all of these companies in the United States don't, don't do that. But in China, they force American companies to do that. And I think that, that gut reaction that says this just isn't right is fueling the, the motivations of people like John Bolton and Donald Trump. And, in, and again, a lot of us don't agree with the Trump policy and the way that Trump does things, but a broken clock is right twice a day. And in this sense, I actually think there's some legitimacy to it. Let me come to you and, and challenge you a little um, bit. Eric, before, and, so, sorry, before you, you just, just hooking onto that point very briefly, it's very interesting to hear that perspective, you know, from an African perspective, simply because... You know, from, from the, the perspective of being a developed, not only, a, you know, in the developing world, but really in the developing part of the developing world, um, the way that China managed to leverage its massive market and managed to force technology transfer, IP transfer, all of these things that are seen as these kind of big, big, um, you know, betrayals in the U.S. are conclusions devoutly wished for in Africa. You know, so all of those, all of these things are things that Africans would love to pull off. You know, like to to be able to 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 you know to literally to, to force people to to have some form of like investment in the country rather than you know simply simply manufacturing and exporting, but like you know to actually have to have to train people. All of these things, and it's something that they're always trying to get Chinese companies to do more of. You know, so all of this, all of this, so much pressure from from below in Africa. To, to get some of these things that they, that they feel that China have, has achieved. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of to see it from, from the African side because all of the things that these kind of massive betrayals are all things that Africans would die to have. Um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. It is. And so, Josh, let's get your take on this before. I, I was going to play devil's advocate, but I want to kind of stay on this line of questioning here is that maybe the sense of betrayal and the, 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 the sense that the China watching community got it wrong is, well, you know what? In geopolitics, there's no crying in geopolitics. There's no crying in baseball. You know, pull up your big boy pants and get on with it. You know, rising powers never play by the rules of the incumbent powers. That is just the rule and law of, of history, right? And if we take Graham Allison at his word in the Theocities trap, uh, they're not supposed to play by the rules. And that's why wars come about this. So in some ways, and let me just play devil's advocate here, are you and other China watchers who may be critical of China just complaining over the fact that you got beat, that the United States is getting beat? And is that really at the core maybe of the tension that's here right now, is that this is what happens when rising powers do challenge incumbent hegemons? Well, that, there's a lot to unpack there, <coughs> uh, certainly. Um, well, let me, let, 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 let's just say this. Um, I would say that the best analogy for an American to understand how Americans tend to feel is the old Lucy and Charlie Brown with the football routine. Um, I think that we have heard so many times the we are changing line. How many American delegations have been to China and heard, give us more time, we're changing. We're getting rid of these policies. We're going to become more liberal. More opening up is going to happen. We are on reform and opening up path. Um, and therefore, we will reform and opening up. And this will continue. We have heard that for so long that there is nobody who wouldn't at this point be a little bit fatigued of it. And um, we can line up like Charlie Brown again and go to kick the football. But I think that's why we're seeing in the China-U.S. trade negotiations that it's really hard to move forward because the U.S. side simply has a lack of trust in the Chinese side, that they simply don't believe that this time the football isn't going to be pulled away from them. Um, and so the betrayal has, I think, a lot to do with expectations being mismet, but it has to do with the fact that the Chinese helped us or led us down the primrose path to believe our own mistruths. 
Um, we believed them in Iraq and Afghanistan of our own volition. The Iraqis were saying, we're not going to be like you. And we said, oh, no, you will. But in China's case, for decades, the Chinese have said, no, we are becoming more like you. We are moving in this direction. And so when we wake up and we find that that has not happened, in fact, it has regressed, there is, I think, a quite natural sense of disappointment. With regard to the Thucydides trap, I think it is awful. And I think if my student wrote it, I would not pass them in their dissertation. It lacks so much rigor, rigor in terms of an understanding of the full complexities of what drive international relations, particularly among countries like the United States and China, which have very different cultural and very different political systems. To believe in the Thucydides trap is to believe that it doesn't matter what political system you have. Simply being a rising power is enough, and I do not believe that. To me, our fates are in our own hands, not determined by some uh, um, kind of predictive theory that old white men believe because they can't speak Chinese and they don't study China. So I would set the Thucydides <laughs> trap aside completely, and I would urge all of your readers to do so, and I would say if you don't believe me, read the reviews of the book and you'll feel more confident in doing so. Again, getting back to the fundamental point we're making here, though, I would suggest that the U.S.-China relationship, in fact, China's relations with many countries around the world, need to be redressed in terms of building a level of confidence that what Chinese friends are saying is more than simply the rhetoric which is convenient of the time, but reflects actual policy. Now, uh, on your show, you've had some great people talk about what's going on in terms of China right now in Beijing. And so it may be not possible for the Chinese to even predict their own future, let alone to explain it to foreigners very well. But we should be very, I, I would say that there is a great deal of eye rolling these days in Washington. If Chinese friends come to Washington and give us the old, we're changing, give us more time routine. I think um, after 20 years, people have said you've had enough time. Um, and when you were a small or poor, rather, developing country, it was fine to kind of take these advantages. But at this point, you're the second biggest economy of the world. Times have changed and a leadership is now required. And that leadership requires setting down some of the things you use to get to your uh, uh, second tier status, uh, um, not second tier, um, second uh, uh, place economic status, and allowing other countries like those in Africa to take advantage of them and to transfer some more technology, transfer some more skills, um, and help others get their hand on that first rung of the development ladder, uh, which China itself did with the support of American investors and investors from overseas. But I mean, in all in all fairness, that's that's not the, the the particular kind of remedy that that Bolton and company was was pushing, right? They they weren't trying to get China to do in Africa what the U.S. had done in China. They they were simply they wanted China to stop what it's doing, right? Well, I'm certainly not going to sit here and defend the policy. In fact, as you said very rightfully a moment ago, Kobus, there's a little meat on the bones of this policy to really know what it is. I think the only thing we do know is that this policy, to be successful, would have to be resourced properly. It would have to have increases in aid. It would have to have increase in technology transfers. And it would have to have more support for the USX Bank and a variety of different other uh, uh, venues where the U.S. could expand its relations, um, uh, excuse me, on the economic side. Um, but at the end of the day, the U.S. simply lacks the tools that China has um, to uh, move as fast as China might. And the, the nature of the market at this time is that there is soft demand in the U.S. for African products. So it's not as if even the most open trade regime, which AGOA is, is pretty good, but it's not even if it were 100 percent open, um, the, how much more trade would flow um, it's not determined by John Bolton and the U.S. government. It's determined by market demand. Um, so the whole idea that one's going to take on China and Africa, it's fanciful. Um, it's not uh, the game such and so that the U.S. is playing. It's not a game we necessarily could play. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa-China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Let's give it a little bit of a reaction. Uh, Reva Levinson, who's a president and CEO of KRL International, which I guess is a D.C.-based consultancy. There are a million of them in D.C. 
Uh, she said she said something very interesting here and echoes a little bit of what you're saying, Josh. And um, this is a quote. She said, I am saving my judgment of the Africa strategy, Prosper Africa, for release of the fiscal year budget in 2019, at which point we will know what the Trump Africa strategy really means. And this kind of backs up a little bit about what you're saying is whether or not the administration will put more resources behind its Africa strategy. Highly, highly unlikely. I'd also like to draw some attention to Colonel Chris Wyatt. He's the director of African studies at the U.S. Army War College. He tends to have a more conservative outlook, oftentimes supporting a Trump worldview. And uh, three points that I want to read about the uh, about the, the the Bolton announcement. He said, "Quote: Folks who took a speech delivered at the Heritage Foundation to be a strategy missed the point. True, Ambassador Bolton called it a strategy, but it was not published and remained so." and made little reference to ways and means. This was much more a philosophy about engagement in Africa, and all the focus on great power competition is missing what was said in the speech. There is much in the speech that is encouraging and some that should be of concern to. Yes, Bolton said China 14 times, but get over it. Move on. Pay attention to what he did say. The China bashing was gratuitous. So it's interesting how, you know, again, he's saying he's focusing less on the China part, and more on the accountability for UN peacekeeping, the fight against terrorism, and the focus on uh, private enterprise, which of course is the main reason for the creation of the International Development Finance Corporation, which we spoke with Aubrey Ruby. Uh, If you want to check out an earlier show on that, it is very much a counterpoint to Chinese state development-led infrastructure financing. So talk to me a little bit about maybe this different approach that the Americans might be taking in Africa as a way to contrast and against the Chinese in such a way that they want to make a more appealing offer. Well, I agree uh, that, you know, this speech more than a strategy was essentially marching orders for the U.S. government. It was trying to get folks lined up on side to understand what our Africa approach is going to look like in an umbrella sense. So I agree this isn't like a national defense strategy where you've got lied, layout before you very clear um, instructions. I completely agree with that. And so we're going to have to wait, as Koba said a few moments ago, um, until there's more meat on, on, on these bones. I think what the speech lacks, what it needs and what it lacks, is a commitment to U.S. values. Um, it, it speaks about taking on China and its predatory practices. It talks about making a UN uh, uh, peacekeeping accountable. But where is the commitment to open and free democratic processes? Uh, where are the U.S. values that juxtapose us with the Chinese system and, in my personal opinion, make us a more attractive Option and in fact, you know, stepping back, neither option is actually very attractive. I mean, maybe uh, Corbis, you can talk about what it's like in Africa. But if I were African, putting myself in an African shoes, the U.S. system shutting down the government, this and that. Meanwhile, the Chinese system, um, increasingly authoritarian. To me, neither of these systems is particularly attractive. So to make the U.S. system more attractive to actually compete with China, what you'd have to do is talk about U.S. values, which are open values. Anybody can believe in uh, the Declaration of Independence. Anybody. You don't have to be um, of a certain ethnic background or a certain gender or be born in a certain place. But none of us can become Chinese unless we're born Chinese. So the, the China dream is a closed dream. The American dream is an open dream. And that is empty. It's not in this uh, this call to arms. Um, the idea is we're going to take on China, but how are we going to do it? Well, that's unclear. And I would say the greatest uh, sword we have or the greatest arrow we have in our quiver is not on display in this speech. And as an American, to me, that is the biggest problem with the Trump doctrine, if we could call it that to this point, is that it abandons American values in an attempt to try to achieve American interests. And to me, that is a fool's errand. Um, Fundamentally cannot work until we walk with our values up front. But isn't that the Trump way, which is interests over ideals? I mean, that was the calculation he made in Saudi Arabia. It's the calculation he's made at the United Nations where he's saying we're going to only, you know, support those countries that support us. Those values that you're talking about may not be relevant as much in the Trump administration as they were in previous administrations. Undoubtedly. And that's my complaint as an American. Um, To me, you're, you're taking the special sauce and you're leaving it off. And it's the special sauce that's the special part. 
right? Um, forming a country, uh, sovereignty, uh, governments, all countries have these things. What makes America different or what should make us different is our values. If we can lead with those, I think we're strong. And we're going to take some criticisms, right? Especially in a place like Africa. If you walk around and you talk about free and fair all the time, there are folks in Africa who are going to say, stop interfering in our internal affairs, get out of our business, stop judging us. You're going to get those criticisms for sure. But you are going to be standing upon, I consider, a firm foundation of who you are as a nation. Even if you take those hits, you do it in the quest of something more and something better. But at this point, it seems we're questing after U.S. interests. We're forgetting who we are, and it's just not going to be all that attractive. So when, when Corbus says to, um, that in Africa, this basically Basically, was a non-issue. Nobody even noticed it. I'm not surprised at all because there isn't anything in here that's specifically um, speaking to either the hearts or the minds of Africans. It's basically saying Africa is the next playing field for us to uh, tussle with the Chinese. Um, and so uh, the Chinese are bad and we're good. Uh, get on our side. So it went over like a ton of bricks. Not surprising. Um, I'm not saying if there had been other uh, flowery language about uh, American values, it would have been much better received. But I'm saying that it would have at least had a core um, an American core that was distinctly American that would distinguish it in a way that people could recognize. I think also, yeah, I agree with you. You know, kind of Africa is reduced to a background, um, and and this is obviously very reminiscent of the Cold War. You know, kind of where there's, there was generally just a, a kind of a lack of interest in in African specificity, um, and you know, differences between specific between different African countries, for example, just don't register. You know, kind of in this in this discourse at all, um, and Africa becomes this kind of open field. You know, like, uh, you know, which is the problem that Africa faces all the time, which is a refusal to deal with African specificity. And you do get that even also among Chinese, you know, kind of actors. Um, you know, where, where Africa is essentially seen as this kind of blank slate which can be which can be turned into anything that we need it to be. Um, and so, so I think that that's one big problem. Um, the other big problem, I think, is that <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, again, you know, kind of I don't spend a lot of time in the U.S., but it seems to me that there is, um, uh, you know, n maybe not h high enough awareness in the U.S. of how how transparent the U.S. is, thanks to its incredibly well developed media. You know, so Africans have very high awareness of what's going on in the U.S. and um, and uh, African discourse is very is very much you know influenced by many many uh, Af American voices, particularly African American voices. So, you know, Africans have, I think, um, you know, again, you, you know, it's easy to, to, to generalize, and I think it's truer for younger Africans with more media access, of course. Um, but they, you know, they, they have, uh, they consume a lot of American media, and they're very literate in American media, a lot of them. And so they, they see a lot of, of American problems American inequities, discrimination problems, police brutality problems, and so on, they see via, they see it kind of from the inside of the US because they're consuming so much commentary coming from the US about these issues. So in that sense, I think, you know, I don't know that, that the US is really grappling with the complicated power of its own pop culture. Because on the one hand, it is incredibly powerful in the old you know, soft power Joseph Nye way, sure. Like, you know, Beyonce is very, very popular in, 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 in Africa, and that counts for something in relation to, you know, how the U.S. is seen. But Beyonce herself is a very trenchant critic of certain aspects of American society. And, you know, she, she is an, kind of an insider speaking about insider experiences of being black to a black continent. Just Let me interrupt you very discounted. quickly here. And, and just say that's not only just in pop culture, which is where your focus is, but I've spoken to several African scholars, uh, albeit they're here in China, so their perspective may not be neutral in that sense. But they, they reminded me, they said, listen, the United States is the country that literally banned Africans from immigrating under the Trump administration. Several exactly. African countries were on the, the, the Muslim immigration ban. The, the steel tariffs uh, had a really profound impact on South Africa. Uh, this is the country that withdrew uh, the uh, free trade privileges for Rwanda. The president said, you know, made up a country, Nambia, you know, all these little slights, if you will. So it's not just in the, 
the pop culture realm, well, there may be a misunderstanding or a misreading in Washington of how Africans perceive them, but there's also among scholars, academics, and and political elites that are frustrated with some of U.S. policies uh, that have been under the Trump administration. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, kind of. So, so it seems to me that 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 kind of complexity doesn't kind of feature in this you know, kind of in this document. Not in a way that that would make up for but, you know, I, I one of the really smart takes on this on on the, the difference between China and, and and the US in Africa was a piece in foreign policy by Lena Ben Abdallah, who we've interviewed um several times before on the show. And she made the point that this isn't just two different policies. The the Chinese policy is based on countless state visits, lots and lots of exchanges, lots of people-to-people exchange, which means it's a, it's a very kind of dense network of, of, of kind of relations between the two. You know, so that is not easy to replicate, you know, and, um, and it, can be, it can be kind of, you know, it can be made up for in other ways because the U.S. has such a kind of other powerful, um, you know, arrows in its quiver that, that China doesn't possess, um, you know, pop culture being one of them. But it's not, you know that that is it's not at the moment it's not being used in 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 a way that would make up for for that kind of network building that China has been doing for decades. Uh, Kobus, if I might jump in here, I think this is a great point you're making about American soft power. Uh, Ambassador Shin and I have been looking at this since our first trip to Africa in 2007 uh, in our joint research. Of course, Ambassador Shin served there many years before, um, and it's it was noticeable. I mean, I went to an American hip hop concert in Angola, um, and I saw it myself. I completely agree. The U.S soft power, particularly African-American music and culture, um, is is unrivaled in Africa, particularly Chinese soft power. Chinese soft uh, uh, culture is almost non-existent in that regard. And when we, in our recent trip um, this summer, we met with several Chinese ambassadors, and they kept saying to us, oh, we've been instructed to increase Chinese soft power. Um, and I kept scratching my head, you know, just, has, been, has Beyonce been instructed to increase U.S. soft power? I mean, obviously not. So I don't think, you know, these are two different things. One is foreign-focused propaganda work. Um, driven by the party to achieve national objectives as set forth in Beijing. And the other is because I like to make great music and others like great music too, so I develop this relationship with them through the music. That is the natural definition of soft power, and I couldn't agree more that that is empty or not mentioned in this uh, strategy or this policy. Um, In part, it's a generational thing. In part, it's a racial thing. Um, John Bolton is an old white guy. He probably doesn't listen to much Beyonce music. He doesn't understand the power of American hip-hop culture. I was born and raised in New York in the late 90s. To me, hip-hop culture is a part of who I am. So in part, this is a generational issue, and over time it will be redressed. But I completely agree. The U.S. has not deployed its soft power to achieve its ultimate political aims. But isn't that, at the end of the day, what makes soft power soft power, that it's not deployed by some government to take advantage of uh, for some political objective, but it comes spring forth organically from a people um, and from who they are? Um, there, there's one additional point I'd mention here, which is, while there is a great deal of desire in Washington for competition with China, for years there have been people putting forward plans to cooperate between China and the U.S in Africa. I've been hearing this for over a decade. Places like the U.S. Institute of Peace and others have engaged a variety of Chinese actors to try to enhance U.S.-China cooperation on the continent. To my knowledge, none of them has really been successful. So while I'm not sure the U.S. can compete with China and Africa, I'm not sure our efforts to cooperate have achieved really much of anything except for a whole lot of banquet dinners. Um, And I think that speaks to the differences in our values, the differences in our systems, uh, perhaps who we're engaging with, our economic uh, approaches, um, our comparative advantages. But it's important, I think, to note that there have been a variety of different efforts, some of them pretty well funded, to enhance U.S.-China cooperation on the continent, and none of them really have gone anywhere. And it's hard to see that ever happening now, given the current state of affairs. Agreed. Uh, let's-, uh, let's wrap up our discussion now. Um, You spend time in China, you spend a lot of time, obviously, in the U.S. and in Washington, and you were just on, uh, as you said, on a multi-country tour in Africa doing research for your new book that you're working on with Ambassador Shin. Uh, Just a little heads up for everybody. 
in case you are not familiar with uh, Josh and Ambassador Shin's previous book, China and Africa, A Century of Engagement, it's kind of like your baseline textbook for everything China, Africa over the past 100 years. And it really, I have it on my desk right now. I use it quite a bit as a reference book. Uh, it's not a page turner, but it's when you need to find out about a specific country, you go right to it, almost like an encyclopedia. So highly recommend it. Unfortunately, it is one of these ridiculously expensive academic books. It was like 60 bucks, but in your library probably has it and whatnot. Okay. There's a plug for you. Log rolling for you too, okay? Um, 60 bucks is not <laughs> expensive for an academic book, is it, Kobus? No, sadly. <laughs> no, but for those of us on the Kindle universe where we're used to spending nine bucks for a book, 60 bucks feels outrageous. <laughs> but it's worth it. It's worth it. Fair enough. So let's wrap up our discussion. You guys were just in Africa talking to a lot of, of, of key folks on both sides and all sides of the topic. You were, you've been in China quite a bit. What's going to happen this year? Rub the magic, you know, the magic eight ball and say, are we going to have conflict? Are we going to, is this just going to peter out? Uh, what's your forecast for the, the next one to two years of the Trump administration in the China, Africa, U.S. relationship? Ooh, well, that's that. I mean, that's that's the question everyone wants to know. Suits saying is a dirty or t difficult business. Um, that's why they pay you the big bucks at the University of Texas. Oh, yes, indeed, indeed. Um, <laughs> so let, let's put it this way. I mean, uh, just as one of your excellent guests a few weeks ago talked about how China is going to be very internally focused um, in the next in 2019 uh, with all of its domestic challenges, no FOCAC, uh, no BRICS, um, I would say the U.S. is going to continue where it's at, which is a very inward focused political agenda. Um, I mean, right now we're so focused on building walls uh, against the outside and shutting down governments. It's hard to see how there's going to how this policy is going to be implemented in a meaningful way. Um, I guess the maybe maybe the good thing is that if we're not looking at Africa for its own sake, um, if we're looking at it because of China, at least we're looking at it more. Um, and maybe that's a I, I don't know how to put that, but I think that it, our, uh, we have so long devalued Africa, and Africa is a young continent, it's an up-and-coming continent, it's a dynamic place, and while Asia is aging, particularly uh, East Asia, Northeast Asia, Africa is, is the youngest place in the world, and the Chinese have done a great job in recognizing that and courting that generation. And as uh, we've talked about, we, the Americans, have a great set of soft power tools at our disposal um, to enhance the people-to-people -people relationship and build those ties. Uh, of course, the African-American community, which has um, these ethnic ties to Africa, is, again, something China simply lacks. Uh, so we've got great advantages here. Um, if we could, to some degree, get out of our own way, I think we could have a very prosperous next two years uh, with Africa. Um, it just seems to me that the prioritization is just not there. Um, it's just not... It's just not there. And all you have to do is turn on the nightly news on any channel in the U.S. and you can go months without even one story about Africa. Not even one. So the the consciousness, the it, it's just... Um, it's not there. Um, and I would say the Middle East is different. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, you can't go two days without seeing stories about the Middle East, whether it be uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Israel, etc. So um, it seems to me that the U.S.-China relationship will muddle through. I don't see any great changes uh, on the horizon. Uh, of course, there could be a great economic turndown, which could lead to the default of a variety of different loans, and that could put China uh, under great bit of pressure and other lenders to African countries. But that, again, is something that nobody can tell. So I would say the U.S.-China-Africa relationship is going to continue to muddle through. We're not going to see any dynamic changes because of this policy, um, either towards cooperation or towards competition. China has nothing to fear from America's Africa strategy as it's largely bluster. That's the headline that Josh Eisenman and uh, David Shin did not write, but it's for the column that appeared in uh, the South China Morning Post uh, uh, a Sunday ago. We've got links for it on uh, in the show notes, and you'll find it everywhere. I'll make sure you get it. If you if you if you don't have it, send me an email, Eric at China Africa Project, and I'll send you to you. It's a worthwhile article. In some ways, Ambassador Shin and Josh are bringing up the policy because nobody else is talking about it, and it's really interesting to uh, 
to, to kind of discuss and see where we are with it. You guys are writing a book. When can we expect that book of yours to get the follow-up to uh, a century of engagement? Ah, the cruelest question to ask an academic. <laughs> yes, indeed. Put him on the spot. Ah, Cobus, uh, you understand uh, where I'm at with this. Um, essentially, <laughs> yes, amb- I'm crying as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Shin and I, uh, we've we've completed our, our field work. Uh, we did uh, over 85 interviews in China. We've done over 100 in Africa. A um, variety of American policymakers as well. Um, this book is going to be primarily focused on the political and security relationship, which, as you've gone over in the show, is increasing substantially at the same time that the economic relationship seems to have, um, I wouldn't say stagnated, but at least reached what you call peak China-Africa. So the book will be uh, primarily focused on those elements, and there has not been to date uh, a monograph uh, looking at the China-Africa political and security relationship. So that'll be a nice contribution. Uh, In terms of the date of when it'll be out, um, it's an academic book. uh, It's under contract with the University of Pennsylvania Press, so it will go under peer review. We're hoping that by the end of this year, it'll be submitted and under peer review. So we're hoping that next year it'll be out. Um, That's our plan, and um, we'll see if we can hold to it. Maybe at the same time as the U.S. policy kind of kicks in in Africa, your book will come out. So we'll we'll have that... uh that to work on. So Josh Eisenman is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, a regular contributor to our show and just a great voice in the China-Africa space. Uh, So Josh, thank you very much for joining us early in the morning from Austin. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, guys. And keep up the good work. You guys are uh, really an excellent voice out there in the China-Africa space, having so many different people come on, talk about their research. Um, I'm not surprised you you guys have millions of listeners, and I know you'll have millions more. Oh, we should hire him for Thank our agent, so Cobus. This is awesome. <laughs> When's so, that check coming? Thanks out? so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs> the big takeaway for me from talking to Josh, and every single time I talk to Josh, is the fact that I think we're all having different conversations here. There just isn't a common dialogue going on. The Americans, when they talk to the Chinese, uh, I'm telling you, we're on it's Mars and Venus, Cobus. And when I talk to young Chinese people and even to policymakers and scholars, they don't understand where we're coming from. They don't understand the shifts that have happened in American society and American culture. And I know for a fact that Americans don't understand what's happening in Africa. And, and again, the variety of discussions that are happening in Africa. Africa, for most Americans, is this very simplistic type of concept the, the, the diversity that exists within Africa is something that's lost on them. The fact that it's 54 countries and even within big countries like Nigeria and South Africa and Kenya, there are massive factional differences. Uh, we, we, uh, that's all lost on us. We are an inwardly focused people right now in the United States. Again, our own government is barely operating. And so, and then I think too often in Africa, they don't understand what's happening here in China, that the mood in China is changing that the economy here is slowing, people are becoming afraid, there is a lot less tolerance of sending billions of dollars to to Africa. Uh, People here would like to focus on domestic issues, and people are nervous about the U.S.-China trade relationship in China. So we're all having three separate conversations among Chinese, Africans, and Americans. That worries me a lot. Yeah, me too. Um, For me also... You know, <clears throat> the, the the issue is from the African side, I think, is also that there isn't, I, I think there isn't in, enough kind of um, awareness or maybe sympathy in the world for this kind of existential position that Africa is in. It's an incredibly young population. Um, so, you know, you have, you have countries, I think Malawi is the one that I remember, um, where the median age of the population is 18. So this is essentially, a, th- these are a group of, massive group of people, you know, kind of essentially holding their futures in their hands and like waiting to see if there's going to be a gap for them. Um, you know, so, it, you know, it's, there's something kind of really heartbreaking for me about about the, the kind of discussion about, oh, is Africa going to go for a Chinese system or an American system? Like, which, you know, which way is it, is it going to, you know, which one is it going to take on? With no, if with no awareness of the fact that what I think a lot of Africans really are looking for is for some kind of way forward for Africa itself. You know, they're not particularly interested in China, I think a lot of them. Um, They're really only interested in Africa. They're really only interested in trying to find some kind of way where they can have some kind of life, you know, kind of where this this youth that, that the entire continent has 
is not going to be squandered. Um, so that is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big issue, you know, kind of because because no one is, you know, it's it's, it's very difficult to not start to think of, of all these young people as some kind of problem, you know, kind of that that is that is how um, I think the G20, for example, thinks of them. You know, it's like oh, they're going to be causing problems by either migrating or by radicalizing or by you know supporting you know kind of populist movements or by dying, you know. But there's so little kind of sympathy for these are people's lives. These are young people like looking forward and trying to see what their lives are going to be like, um, you know, and and so. For for me, I, I, that, that's the, that's the kind of dimension that's actually not not being discussed. And if you don't discuss that, then you don't get Africa. You don't get where people are. Um, you know, and and then the, the China Africa relationship, you you also don't get that. You know, kind of because that's that's the energy that drives what is frequently quite you know kind of like engagement that that even though it makes Africans nervous about it in lots of different ways, there is this is the driving reason why they tend to like engage with, with China, even if China scares them in some kind of way. Um, you know, so, yeah, you know, kind of it's, it's a bit of rambling, but, but that it has to be taken into account. So what do you think about it? This is a topic that affects all, you know, billions and billions of people. If we take into account the populations of China, Africa, the U.S., clearly the geopolitics are so important. Uh, we'd like to hear what you think about it. Do you agree with some of the sentiments expressed by by Professor Eisenman and and Ambassador Shin in their column in the South China Morning Post, uh, and, and just or do you have a different take on it? But this is something that we all have a stake in to some extent or another. We'd love to hear from you, uh, so please do send your comments to us. You can email Cobus and I directly. We've been getting a lot of mail recently from listeners around the world uh, suggesting topics and suggesting and giving us their feedback directly. We'd love to hear from you. Please, please email us. It's fantastic. Email addresses are in the show notes. Uh, very quickly, Cobus, before we go, I always like to give a little shout out to some of the folks that we meet or that email us. Uh, last week, I had the privilege of going to Beijing, and I had a chance to catch up with uh, Hannah Ryder, Zara, and the entire development reimagined team up there in Beijing. Uh, people who follow the China-Africa space know Hannah Ryder and what her consulting firm, Development Reimagined, do. No one on that team was feeling well. They were all sick. There's a flu going around Beijing right now. So it was extra special to me that people came out uh, to say hello to me. Uh, I also want to give a really just a warm thank you to uh, Zhang Xiaojie, Dina Yang, and the whole team at the Gates Foundation who are doing some really fantastic China-Africa work these days. And they were gracious enough to invite me to present uh, the China Africa Project to them. So that was so much fun to meet everybody and thank you to them. And finally, uh, I had the opportunity to sit down with Ghanaian ambassador to China, uh, Edward uh, Boateng, and he took time. So a very big uh, thank you to Ambassador Boateng, who was kind enough to uh, to to kind of enlighten me a little bit on what Ghana's doing in China and how they're doing in negotiations. We are trying, trying to get Ambassador Boateng to come on the show so he can share some of his insights with all of you. Okay, we went a little bit long today. I apologize, but it's because the conversation with Josh was so interesting. So we hope that you enjoyed it. We'll be back again with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. We promised to kind of take a break from U.S.-China-Africa relations, and we'll get back onto some other topics. But we thought two back-to-back -back shows might give an opportunity for everybody to dive in really to this meaty, important subject. So until next week. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.